the philosophy of transhumanism. I think this is a really important topic to discuss given the current state of our technology, of technological advancement, and where I think we are heading as a civilization, as technology becomes more and more saturated into our daily life and the way that we think about things in human society. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through just the philosophy of this idea. You might even call it a movement. Um, then I'm gonna go over uh, some of the history of it. I'm gonna clear up some misconceptions that the author thinks are uh, brought into discussions around transhumanism. And then we're just gonna talk about it. Whether or not you like it, whether or not you think it's dangerous, uh, whether or not you really want to lean into it and think, oh man, you know, this movement could save humanity if we do it right. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. So the first thing I'd like to put on the board is just a definition. What is transhumanism? Well, it is a philosophical view and movement that is intimately concerned with some of the fundamental questions of human existence. But more specifically, it's related to the place of technology in human life and in human civilization. Quoting from Moore, it is a life philosophy, an intellectual and cultural movement, In an area of study, so there are people doing research in it, which prioritizes reason and the use of technology to accelerate human evolution past our biological limits. Transhumanists think that a lot of the great stuff that we have in human civilization and a lot of the great leaps that we have made historically are due to technology. The discovery of different forms of technology like the fire or the wheel or the pulley and axle and the use of this technology in human society. And so they think broadly that our next step in evolution is going to involve technology and integrating technology into our bodies, into our minds perhaps, and generally more into our daily way of life and really leaning on technology. One way of characterizing this movement is that it affirms the possibility and desirability of improving the human condition through technology. spell today. abbreviate technology tech like that. So first, we can note that it affirms the possibility of improving the human condition through technology. So it primarily leans on historical analysis and, and technical analysis to show that 
look, technology can be a really great boon to humanity. Technology has improved our, our ways of life in many different ways. Look, we have running water, we have plumbing, we have electricity. It's possible that we can use technology to make our lives even better in ways that we cannot even imagine right now due to our own epistemic limits. It also affirms the desirability of improving the human condition in this way. So it doesn't just recognize that it's possible for us to use technology in a helpful way, but it says this is a desirable path. This is the path that we should go down. We should not try to return to a more primitive human society like Rousseau might advocate for, but rather we should seek to saturate technology into life more and more in helpful ways. Along with this, transhumanism is generally non-religious. It's highly rational. It rejects faith in the supernatural, and it really leans on logic and deductive reasoning in order to analyze human life and to provide solutions to the problems that we face. Things are not going to get better, the transhumanists think, by having faith that they're going to get better, by praying to a god or any of this stuff, but by applying reason and technology and rationality towards perhaps reorganizing our, the way that we organize ourselves in society. It is through rationality, logic, and technology that we are going to improve the human condition and solve the problems that we face as humans, such as inequality, poverty, uh, health, disparity, all of this kind of stuff. Generally, transhumanists value progress. They value the idea that perpetual progress can actually be made if we keep doing research into technology and applying it to our daily lives. They generally have an optimistic view about human nature. Transhumanists think that we have the, the wisdom and the power to determine our future in a positive way through the use of technology and to surpass our biological limitations, which are currently holding us back from a more fair, and perhaps more exciting way of living. And so what the transhumanists are concerned with is progressing not only as a race, but progressing as members of a society through the use of technology. And you hear me say the word technology a lot in this lecture. One helpful way of understanding what the transhumanists are about is by comparing it to what we might call humanism. Humanism is a life philosophy. It's also an intellectual movement and cultural movement that prioritizes fixing our problems through the humane, humane sorry, means that we already have, such as education and changing culture normally through conversation, forgiveness, other kinds of human things that we engage in. That's humanism. 
Transhumanists, however, want to use technology specifically to reshape humanity and humanity's future. So they're going to say things like education and changing the culture isn't enough. We actually need to start integrating our society and our own bodies and minds with technology. Elon Musk's Neuralink comes to mind, right? Putting some chip in your brain that allows you to access the internet just by thinking about it. That would be an example of integrating technology with our own bodies. So the humanists will say things like, look, we have a lot of problems in civilization. These problems can be fixed by properly educating people, giving them the proper values, the proper ways of thinking about things, perhaps giving them a certain social or family structure that might help them. The transhumanists say, okay, yeah, that's all well and good, but that's not going to be enough. Ultimately, if we want to solve the problems that face us, the best path forward is not to just lean on what we have right now, but to construct new means, new solutions to the problems that we face using technology. And more talks about this on page four. He says, transhuman emphasizes the way transhumanism goes well beyond humanism in both means and ends. Humanism tends to rely exclusively on educational and cultural refinement to improve human nature, whereas transhumanists want to apply technology to overcome limits imposed by our biological and genetic heritage. Transhumanists regard human nature not as an end in itself, not as perfect, and not as having any claim on our allegiance. Rather, it is just one point along an evolutionary pathway, and we can learn to reshape our own nature in ways that we deem desirable and valuable. By thoughtfully, carefully, and yet boldly applying technology to ourselves, we can become something no longer accurately described as human. We can become post-human. So what the transhumanists want to do is they want to propel us along the evolutionary pathway that we're on. We, they think we're going to be able to have the ability to transcend our human nature, transcend our biological limitations through the use of technology by perhaps getting rid of aging, by being able to cure disease, every disease and ailment with nanotechnology, by outfitting our bodies with machine parts, bionic limbs, perhaps certain implants into our brains. And maybe, just maybe, eventually shedding our mortal flesh entirely and uploading our minds into computers or into the cloud. More comments on this. Becoming post-human means exceeding the limitations that define the less desirable aspects of the human condition. Post-human beings would no longer suffer from disease, aging, and inevitable death, they would have vastly greater physical capability and freedom of form, often referred to as morphological freedom. Post-humans would also have much greater cognitive capabilities and more refined emotions, more joy, less anger, or whatever changes each individual prefers. Transhumanists typically look to expand the range of possible future environments for post-human life, including space colonization, and the creation of rich virtual worlds. Simulations that we could plug ourselves into if we want to. When transhumanists refer to technology as the primary means of affecting changes to the human condition, this should be understood broadly to include the design of organizations, economies, polities, and the use of psychological methods and tools, as well as cybernetics and actual machines and computers. 
So, in general, while transhumanists may vary in their goals, metaphysics, epistemologies, and ethical views, there are a few different ideas and goals that kind of bind them together into one group, which allows us to kind of generalize about this philosophy of life. Generally, transhumanists are materialists. Can anyone tell me what materialism is again? Let's go ahead and shout it out if you know it. That's one version of materialism. What about metaphysical materialism? That everything is material and that everything is made of the real stuff and there's no supernatural stuff. Right. Materialists believe that everything that you see around you, everything that you experience, everything that you imagine, it's just physical stuff. It's just atoms, it's just energy, it's just waves, protons, electrons, quarks, and so on. Your dreams, your wishes, your goals, your mind isn't separate from all of this stuff. It's all one and the same thing, ultimately, just arranged in different ways. So one thing that kind of binds them together is that they're materialists. They don't think the supernatural exists. They don't think that we have minds that are distinct from bodies. But they also believe in something that is related to the philosophy of mind, which is the idea of substrate independence. Has anybody ever heard this phrase before? Substrate independence. Have you heard of it? Maybe. Yeah, do you I know? I feel like I've heard it, but don't ask me to, what it means. You know what I mean? Is right. It, is it like <laughs> uh, that our mind can function without our body, that like we aren't our body in a way, like that our mind is us. Yeah, yeah, that, that is exactly the, the general idea. There are some people who think that minds can only exist in a certain form, in a certain biological form, say. There's a reason why humans have self-consciousness, whereas other animals do not. And it's because we exist maybe in a certain biological organization of atoms and energy and things. Our mind is something like a, a product of being an organic life form. People who believe in substrate independence do not think that. They do not think that minds can exist only in biological life forms. They think that we can construct a mind, we can construct a consciousness out of purely physical things that are not organic at all, like machine parts or computers or an array of artificial intelligences within a computer. The idea of substrate independence is generally the idea that the mind is substrate independent. It doesn't need to exist within a biological life form in order for the mind to exist. A mind can exist in a computer. A mind could exist in the cloud. A mind could exist within a machine. It just depends on the organization of the parts, not generally the underlying substance that makes up the parts, if that makes sense. So they're generally materialists who believe that yeah, minds can exist in computers, machines, whatever. It doesn't have to be in a human body. They're technologists, which means they value technology. They use technology and see the value in it, who generally wish to merge humans with machines.
There's nothing all that great or wonderful about having a, a mortal, human, organic body that's going to die. This is the current evolutionary phase that we're stuck in. We have the capacity, or we will soon in the future, to completely change our physical forms, if we wish, outfit them completely with machine parts, become cyborgs or robots ourselves, to implant various forms of technology in our brains. But generally, they see that our next evolutionary step is the merging of our biological life form with artificial things like machine parts, cybernetics, computers, those kinds of things, digital technologies, information technologies. And one other thread that kind of runs through a lot of transhumanist thought is an optimism that the transhumanists have about our future as long as we utilize technology correctly. There are optimists who want to maximize human freedom and happiness through the careful and logical use of technology. They're not afraid of technology. They see the immense power within it, and they think that technology can be used in very useful ways to make our societies more fair, to make them more just, to make us more happy, and to make us actually get more out of life. Using technology in the correct ways is going to allow us to be happier and to have more freedom. Why? Well, you can think of many scenarios or many, uh, many hypothetical scenarios in which, which this might be the case. Let's say we outfit our human bodies with machine parts on our step to becoming post-humans, where we're more than just our biological flesh, right? Well, if I outfit my body with cybernetic limbs, give myself a metal exoskeleton or something, I can jump higher run faster, I can get places quicker. We could also use technology to improve transfer, transportation generally, right? Maybe someday we'll have bullet trains going all around the globe and you could get anywhere in like an hour. We can use technology to colonize other planets, expanding ourselves out into the cosmos more. We could use technology also potentially to eradicate disease and get rid of not only physical barriers like disease, but socioeconomic barriers between social groups and people. So they really see a lot of potential power in technology. Because if we apply it correctly, not only will we be able to do more things that we want to do, you could live in a simulation if you want, you could visit, you know, uh, Peru by going into a simulation if you want. That's cool. That's fun. You could like really be inside of a video game maybe someday. You know, really gunning people down. That'll give you a rush. So they really see power in technology. And they're not afraid to use it. They think that we should really lean into it. This is kind of a good general overview, I think, of the philosophy of transhumanism. Let's talk now about the history of these beliefs and, and what their intellectual roots are. Because although transhumanism is being discussed more today, its intellectual roots go back centuries. This idea that we can, and perhaps should, transcend our biological limitations for the betterment of ourselves and others has been around for a long time. Moore says that it can be traced back at least to the 13th century, if not earlier. And as philosophers and other thinkers have thought about this idea, 
transhumanist views, transhumanist ideas, ideals and ideas have evolved. Moore says that transhumanist ideas can be found or can be at least partly traced back to the alchemists of the 13th through 18th centuries. know anything about alchemy or what the alchemists were trying to do? I know the hit app, the little app. <laughs> the hit who? The hit app. App? Maybe you've alchemy. watched Full Metal Alchemist? I don't know. What are alchemists trying to do? What was their goal? Anybody know? Philosopher's Stone or something like that? Yeah, could you say more about that? Um, just like find the secret to life and that being in materials or compounds or certain it was, like, it was like a combination of like metals and science and magic all combined into one. Right. Alchemists during their time were utilizing uh, texts that they thought were magical, theology, the current technology and science of the day, in order to construct kind of a, a, a new movement in which they were trying ultimately to eliminate death, to achieve eternal life, immortality, by obtaining the Philosopher's Stone. And what they thought that they could do is by mixing certain substances together and by engaging in a certain spiritual practice and a certain psychological practice, the Philosopher's Stone would become available to them and they'd be able to transcend their biological limitations and live forever. Carl Jung has famously wrote about how um, the alchemists have strongly influenced the development of science in our day, as well as some spiritual and religious beliefs that are still with us. Moore also traces transhumanist beliefs to the thinker Mirandola in the 15th century. Francis Bacon in the 17th century. De Condorcet in the 18th century, Fedorov, Nietzsche, and Finot in the 19th century, and Stevens and Bogdanov in the 20th century. All of these thinkers in their own ways have contributed to the development of transhumanism by latching on to this idea that humans as we are right now, evolutionarily, physically, psychologically, are not perfect, we're not the best that we can be, and our biological limitations and our psychological limitations, our cognitive limitations, are holding us back in various ways from becoming a more perfect, rational, just happy specimen. And so what all these thinkers have in common is that they were philosophizing about how human nature might be transformed so that we can become something more than we are now, whether that's for our own goals and desires or for the, de the betterment of society and civilization generally. Generally, we can also find transhumanist ideas drawing on enlightenment ideals and views. 
Notably, transhumanism champions a few Enlightenment ideals. Now we've talked about the Enlightenment in this class again. Can someone reiterate what was the Enlightenment? Was it like a time frame where it was more about science and discovery? Right. The Enlightenment was uh, an intellectual and cultural movement in which there's an explosion of knowledge occurring, generally in Europe and in which these thinkers are kind of, I've said before, trying to throw off the shackles of religious dogma that have been placed on them by ancient and medieval philosophy, particularly medieval philosophy, and really leaning into rationality, science, and progress using technology as a means. And so we also see these ideals within transhumanism as well. The focus on rationality, the value and importance of science and scientific research, and how these things can contribute to social and economic and existential progress. One of the key ideas within the philosophy of transhumanism is the idea of the singularity. Does anybody know what the singularity is? Like the, Has anybody the, heard of it? Yeah, like the point in which we like become one with technology, right? Like, like a technological singularity. Right, that's definitely a part of it. A lot of trans, yeah. It's like when like we become God, but like, like it's like when you, it's like when humanity, re, well, like when whatever you want to call post-humans, right? Like eventually, right, if humans keep expanding outward into the cosmos and creating like all this stuff, right, eventually we'll like encompass the entire universe and become the singularity, right? Like that everything is, ever that we are everything and everything is us. Yeah. And we become like the universe in a way. That, that is the end point of some thinkers who philosophize about the singularity. Yeah. Generally, the singularity is this time in the future that a lot of transhumanists and te technologists believe is coming when our technological advancement is going to proceed so rapidly and our intelligence alongside it is going to proceed so rapidly that we become something of a different life form post-human by integrating ourselves with machine technology, digital technology, information technology. So what the singularity is supposed to denote is this time in our future, some people say it's gonna happen pretty recently, or pretty soon, that there's going to be an explosion of knowledge and technological advancement which will propel an evolution in the human race. One notable transhumanist, Kurzweil, has written extensively on the singularity. He's written a book called, I believe, the, the Singularity is Near or The Singularity is Coming, or something like that, in which he performs an analysis of humans' relationship with technology and shows that our technological advancement has been increasing uh, exponentially since humans started using technology. What Kurzweil thinks is that we're reaching a critical point where our technological advancement and therefore our knowledge of the universe and our mastery over the universe and matter and energy is going to be exceeding 
so rapidly that it's going to propel an evolution in our species. The end of the singularity, Kurzweil thinks, is that once we have achieved a sufficient level of technological advancement, knowledge of the universe, we'll be able to freely manipulate any matter that we want, transforming it into anything that we want, being able to become one with machines if we want. We could construct a, a digital uh, hive mind consciousness if we'd like. And Kurzweil thinks that this is likely going to happen in our future. We're going to become one with machines. We're going to completely colonize the universe. And in virtue of being one with machines and colonizing the entire universe, uh, we will have taken all of the matter of the universe and integrated into ourselves, thereby becoming God. Pretty crazy idea, right? To talk a little bit about the singularity, I have a video to show you, which I think will help explain some of these ideas a little bit more and perhaps what is coming down the pipe if we continue leaning into technological advancement. But when you see the phrase technological singularity or even just singularity, you've got a pretty good idea in your mind of what that means. In popular culture, the singularity generally refers to the idea of general artificial intelligence that is capable of improving itself. This results in an uncontrollable reaction referred to as the intelligence explosion, eventually leading to the creation of Skynet or other similarly apocalyptic scenarios. Oh no! However, this scenario of runaway AI is only one of several definitions and interpretations of the singularity. Depending on which interpretation we consider, the likelihood of the singularity actually happening ranges from 100% inevitable, likely within the next several years, to Jesus Christ, let's pray this never fucking happens because, oh my god, no. Today, we're going to take a look at the full range of interpretations so that oh, we can see what's definitely in our future, what might be, and what really hopefully is not. The oh, lovely. Gotta love YouTube ads. The dumb oh. singularity. Huh. Most forms of the singularity involve either artificial intelligence or some other form of super intelligence. Mm -hmm. While the scenario is most often called non AI singularity, not all of the other scenarios involve AI, so we found this name to be a bit more fitting. The core definition of the singularity is that it is a key point in time in which the technological advancements occur at a much faster rate, causing civilization and technology to be nearly unrecognizable before that point in time. Though this is often referred to as a hypothetical point with regards to an intelligence explosion, it's also something that has already happened several times throughout human history. Proponents of this broader definition aren't hypothesizing about when or if theoretical singularity could occur. They're making estimates as to when the next one will come. And the answer, it turns out, is actually going really soon. The easiest way to think of this more expansive version of the singularity is to think of the various epochs of human history, the barrier between each being another singularity. While it may seem like ancient history to us, consider how people of the Iron Age would have viewed the world a decade or so after it entered the industrial Technology advanced far beyond anything that would have seemed possible to them, and the world was virtually an unrecognizable place. Likewise, consider how the world changed at the start of the Atomic Age or Information Age. There are people alive who witnessed the transition both from the Industrial to Atomic Age and from the Atomic Age to the Information Age. Each of those points represented a rate of technological growth that would have seemed impossible only years earlier. The singularity need not be defined solely by human epochs either, especially as many of these are poorly defined as well. The invention of the pulley by ancient Egyptians 4,000 years ago was likely a singularity, as was the invention of the wheel 2,000 years before that by the Sumerians. Now, for those who prefer a broader interpretation of the singularity, there have been many, and there will be many more to come. 
And we are currently on the cusp of one now, thanks to nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is expected to revolutionize the world yet again. And scientists predict that nanobots will be a huge part of our lives by the 2030s. What separates this singularity from the other types, aside from not really being uncontrollable, is that it doesn't require anything more than our current level of human intelligence. We have to put the work in to make the necessary breakthroughs, but there's no doubt that we will be able to do so. The superintelligence singularity. All right, so now we get to a more popular version of the singularity. It's the kind where we reach a point of incredible technological growth on the back of superintelligence. This comes in two different ways, human superintelligence and speed superintelligence, with the latter being far more simple. Speed superintelligence is essentially just the creation of a general AI that can think exactly like a human. It doesn't need the ability to upgrade itself or possess any superhuman level of intelligence. It essentially just needs to be a human brain in digital form. Humanity is pretty impressive, and we've done a lot of cool sh** over the past few thousand years. By this point, we've pretty much proven that, given infinite time, we will do infinite cool things. The benefit of having human-level intelligence in a computer is that it can make calculations far, far faster than our weak, puny human brains can, at least certain types of them. The human brain is capable of far more calculations than computer, and it's something on the order of a thousand times more processing power than the world's most powerful supercomputers. However, how much of that is actually important? Humans could be seen as wasting a lot of our brain's processing power on unnecessary nonsense like sensory input, maintaining mandatory bodily functions and love. Ah, what a waste of time. If we don't put our artificial intelligence into a fragile humanoid body, it could free up a massive amount of time to process other data. Computers are going to continue to get more powerful as well. So at some point, our AI will be able to think exactly like a human, but a hell of a lot faster. Though it would only need human intelligence, the sheer speed at which it could think would create a type of superintelligence that could lead to the singularity. The other type of superintelligence that could lead to the singularity is human superintelligence. Even this has variations on exactly how it could happen. Will humans somehow evolve superintelligence naturally? Is someone going to give birth to a person so outrageously brilliant that they read the works of Stephen Hawking and think, this guy was a bit dim? Ah, it's certainly possible, but it's not really something we can predict. IQ scores have steadily increased since they were first introduced, which one could argue shows that people are only getting more intelligent over time. However, the veracity of these tests is dubious at best, and there are other factors contributing to the results as well. Besides, have you seen the sh that the ancient Greeks did? Their contributions to math, science, and astronomy are incredible. And the only source they had accomplished any of that was a compass, a straight edge, and an abacus. Even though general knowledge has increased since then, it's hard to argue that actual human intelligence has. It's probably going to take more than good genes and some dumb luck to achieve human superintelligence, and that's where the science come in. At least that's one theory. It's speculated that if humans are able to either augment or interface our brains with machines, that it may provide the ability to amplify our intelligence to superhuman levels. There's a lot of debate over whether this would or would not actually be possible, or if we have to wait for humans to somehow evolve into a more intelligent species. Now, of all these various scenarios, speed superintelligence seems to be the most plausible. However, we're still a long, long way from that ever happening. We lack the computing power, the necessary understanding of the human brain, and the ability to create a general artificial intelligence. While this is something that could potentially happen, we are almost certainly several generations away and won't live to see the day. Sorry about that. Intelligence explosion. Finally, we get to the last version of the singularity and the one you're probably most familiar with. The first step is to create a general AI. Now, we've talked about that in previous videos and why it's not exactly going to be in our immediate future. Next, once we've made that general AI, that AI needs to have the ability to upgrade itself. It needs to be skilled enough to upgrade both its hardware and software without human intervention, thus creating an even more intelligent AI. It could then repeat this process over and over again until it became an artificial superintelligence far exceeding anything that humans could ever dream of. This intelligence explosion is regarded by many as inevitable, and general AI is often referred to as the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. Both of this sentiment and the term intelligence explosion were coined in 1965 by British mathematician I.J. Goodman. 
colleague Alan Turing. This statement is often repeated. It's the creation of artificial superintelligence is regarded as the truest form of the singularity. Once this superintelligent machine is created and has upgraded itself far beyond human understanding, there is no telling what will happen next. Perhaps it will tell us that the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42, without bothering to tell us what the question actually was. Perhaps it will destroy all humans because we're weak, stupid, and mortal. It is literally impossible to guess what will happen after this version of the singularity, which, well, it's kind of the point. And it wouldn't happen all at once, either. Though it is believed that improvements the AI makes to itself will increase in speed, it is unlikely to immediately become a world-ending scenario. Before it reaches a level of intelligence such that humanity becomes worthless, first we'll have the ability to make incredible scientific advancements that will change all of society. Imagine a world in which Nobel Prize-worthy discoveries are taking place every few seconds. The possibilities for what that future reflects are absolutely endless. Perhaps all of your favorite sci-fi toys that we previously told you were totally impossible could begin production that same week. Now it's unlikely since super intelligent AI isn't going to change the laws of physics, but maybe it would have a more complete understanding of those laws such that it could build a real hoverboard that wasn't a totally massive disappointment. Is this intelligence explosion actually going to happen? It all seems like a logical next step. No matter which version of the singularity we're talking about, they all seem like the logical progression of it. That progression may take decades or even centuries longer than we'd like, but it all seems kind of inevitable, right? There is one. Hello, I'm Patrick Stewart. Hi, Patrick Stewart. Did you know you that die, right Professor now? Elephants in the room that we haven't really addressed yet with regards to the superintelligence explosion <laughs> and these other should we create such a machine or program, the runaway reaction of increasing intelligence seems like the only possible outcome. That's probably true, but how the f are we supposed to even go about creating something that can do that? Computers are pretty amazing. They can do things that may seem otherwise impossible. But at the end of the day, they are just machines. They are built by humans for a purpose, and they do exactly as they are told. The vast majority of times a computer does something that differs from expectations, it's just an example of PEBCAP. This is an acronym used by programmers and tech support to condescend the less tech savvy, and it stands for Problem Exists Between Chair and Computer. Basically, if your computer did something unexpected, it's probably because you're an idiot and you did something you shouldn't have. Computers do exactly what they are programmed to do. No more, no less. And that is great for normal use. But the fact that computers will do no more than they are programmed to do creates a real issue for the concept of an intelligence explosion. Humans are, unsurprisingly, limited by human thinking. And even if we're creating the most sophisticated artificial intelligence in the world, it still needs to be programmed initially by humans. You can theoretically create a general AI that will think like a human with sufficient processing power. It can think faster than a human as well. But how can we program it to exceed our limitations? It needs to go beyond natural thinking and achieve some sort of understanding that all humans just don't possess. This is more than just a little problem. Despite other technological constraints, this is almost certainly the single biggest roadblock that could prevent the intelligence explosion from ever happening. Even if you're Harrison Ford or the Astro Creep, it is unlikely anyone could ever create an artificial intelligence that is more human than human. In order to program the AI to think in ways that we can't, we would likely need to understand how to think in ways we can't. If we understood that, it would mean we can actually think in those ways, and so the AI would think we're better than the human. And think about it. If you had a completely blank slate of a person you could teach them to be infinitely smarter than you, how would you tell them to think? In what way could you instruct them to think that is superior to the way that you think? It's not quite as brain melting as trying to imagine if your own consciousness didn't exist, but it's still difficult to the point of being probably impossible. But this is also just arty. There are a respected scientists who believe the intelligence explosion will happen within the next 10 years, 20 tops, even if the creation of such an AI is possible. That timetable seems exceedingly optimistic, but if their predictions are correct and super intelligence AI is only years away, well, I want to welcome the new robot overlords. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about everything I said. Thanks for watching. So one thing that the video mentioned that we haven't even really touched on yet is this idea that one of the ways that transhumanists are trying to achieve their goals and to better themselves and humanity 
is through the creation of artificial intelligences. This is something that we're already doing, and a lot of research is being done into AI. We have artificial intelligence algorithms that can learn how to do various tasks, sort data very effectively, um, to even make uh, predictions and to screen for cancer. There are some artificial intelligences that by looking at an x-ray of a human body can tell with a lot of accuracy whether or not that person has cancer in ways that a human cannot. There's a lot of worry about artificial intelligences and it is strongly related to the philosophy of transhumanism because that seems to be the technology that transhumanists have latched onto for talking about what it is going to become possible for us to do in the near future if we continue technologically progressing as we have the last 10,000 years. We'll talk about the excitement of transhumanism and perhaps the dangers of transhumanism in a little bit. I just want to go over one more thing which is some misconceptions that Moore brings up near the end of the article, in which he tries to set the record straight on what transhumanism actually says and what it does not say. The first thing that Moore notes is that transhumanists are not seeking to create some sort of utopia for humans on the basis of technology. Rather, their belief is in something like perpetual progress, continual improvement, not a perfected state which is static and never changes. This is important because one of the central ideas of transhumanism is evolution. Evolution is possible, evolution is actual, and evolution is going to keep on occurring. Their goal is to not create some perfect static society, but rather to keep on evolving, 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 more progress, more improvements, more intelligence. So if we end up doing something that's bad, with technology that some people say is a utopia, the transhumanists are going to say, nah, that's not our goal in the first place. We got to change some things. So maybe there's some security to be found in that. Moore also wants to reiterate that transhumanism includes predictions and expectations about the future, but it doesn't say anything too specific about what's going to happen in the future because well, we can't predict that with complete certainty. This is largely because we don't really know what's coming down the pipe, especially if an intelligence explosion occurs. If an, if an intelligence explosion does occur, we would not even be able to imagine how our society and how our forms are going to be changed as a result, or what our future society is going to look like, being integrated that strongly with such, Im such powerful technologies that we can't even conceptualize yet because we're not smart enough to do so. Finally, Moore also wants us to keep in mind that transhumanism does not loathe biological life, but rather they, they see it as something useful and good to the extent that we can utilize it for our purposes. It's just inevitable that we are going to evolve to something better whether that evolution comes biologically through natural selection or artificially by augmenting ourselves with machine parts.
I think Moore is saying this because he doesn't want people coming away with the idea that transhumanists are going to go around killing a bunch of people. Rather, they're going to be trying to convince you that you should change yourself with technology. So that's generally the philosophy of transhumanism. Always right. What do you all think of this, of this view, of this movement? Do you believe in the promise of technology? I think it's going to take us to wonderful places. Listen, I'm not upset with white men with engineering degrees. I'm not, right? And that's, but that's who this is for, right? This is this who made this. So I'm. I just think that like I like I agree that it's inevitable and that like uh, we're going to get to a point where I think we're already to a point where we've like become so like reliant on technology and it's like expanded our understanding of like life and the world around us. Um, but like there's also no way in our world to disconnect technology from the capitalism that it der is derived from. So I just think that there's like no way to make this not like scary and evil. You know what I mean? Don't you want, you know, like um, ultra automated luxury robo communism? How are we gonna get to the, 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 the last Musk, part of that? Yeah. If how, so. how is Elon Musk gonna own my brain in communism? That's not gonna happen. Well, nobody's saying anybody's owning each other's brains, but, but, but why do, like, why do if we... If somebody owns the technology and makes the technology that you're putting into my brain and is being used inside my brain, then yeah, you do own my brain. That's a worry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even if you're a transhumanist, you don't have to think that you're going to be putting stuff in your brain necessarily. Maybe but you're just going to be transferring I mean. your consciousness to something But that's, that, that still completely has, like, that's going to be owned under capitalism. So like, I don't I don't think that there's a way that we can get to this unless we completely deconstruct everything first, and that's not going to happen. Well, one we're not going to get to this safely. <laughs> one strategy is util utilizing capitalism to automate everything, and then we don't need capitalism anymore, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, okay. I don't know. I, I see I your think worry. The AI could be a way out. Because of the AI, ah, okay. If, if the, the theoretically an AI which is programmed by humans, right? So like, I don't see like the, the the AI ever like going beyond human understanding. I think I think you don't think I think so? humans. I think since it's programmed by humans, it is going to have the flaws of humans built into it, and there and I think humans tend to think that intelligence is something that can keep growing exponentially because like we're optimistic in that way. But I think there's a ceiling. Like you think so? Man. What if like what if like what if this is what if what if we have figured out a lot of this stuff and like there's really nothing more to the laws of physics than what we figured out? Oh, except there's so the, much more we could except know. Except for the though, little, I maybe mean, the little details. Maybe those will give us some extra like insight. But if like, we're creating something stuff. that is like a combination of a lot of different people's like capacity of thinking, then sure. that thing is going to be smarter than just like individual sure. humans. It depends on what you think, perhaps, the nature of intelligence and consciousness is. I mean, you all have seen the, uh, the Avengers movies, right? Uh, Ultron. Ultron emerges, <laughs> right, from an aggregation of data and algorithms. If you think consciousness is emergent from physical matter, I don't see why. It is. It has to be. It has to be. What else is it? You think God just goes... It could be something completely different. God goes... I don't know. Those, those uh, apes down there, they deserve that. I mean, it just flops it in us. Let me ask a more general question. The transhumanists are big on technology, right? And the promise of technology, or the, the capacity of technology to change our lives. Ooh. That's unfortunate. Eh, it's just tea. That's oh, okay. Um, how much of a role do you think technology should play in our lives? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll go get some here. <laughs> All right, well, we'll Th think about it. Or talk, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves. Technology already plays a pretty big role in our lives, right? Should it play a larger role or a smaller role? There's too much nuance to the question. 
Technology plays in your life already. What'd you say? It's like an accessory right now. It's a tool. I'm, I'm not sure accessory is the best it's word. And it's, an, it's an enhancement. It is so fundamentally integrated with our way of life, I don't even think we can imagine our lives without it. No, for sure not. But also, like, there's so many reasons that I hate technology, and there's so many reasons why I love it. What are the reasons that you love it? Um, because of like interconnectedness with other people, people being able to find community that they couldn't find before, like on s on social like, media platforms, yeah, right? The the reach that it has to so many people and like how fundamental it has been to a lot of people's like journeys of like overcoming like what their life was and like learning that there's more out there than just like what was ingrained into them as a child like that is so important and it's like a huge thing that we see all the time now and i don't want that to go away because like, like that's one of my favorite like that's probably my favorite thing about technology as a general <laughs> it's just like the, like ability of like the reach that it has we, we can think of technology in terms of information technology, but we can also think of it more broadly, right? A fork is a piece of technology. True. The wheel is a piece of technology, but right? that's not what they mean when they, they're talking about uploading your thoughts into a cloud. They're not like, hmm, this fork. Right, but, <laughs> but they recognize that humans have made such amazing technological process, progress since we began creating and inventing things that while their focus is on the current forms of technology that we have now, what they're going to do is they're going to bolster their argument. They're going to say, look at all the amazing things technology has given us. Or if like Plumbing, electricity. Technology has allowed us to construct all these houses and buildings that we live in. Now it allows us to connect to people on the other side of the globe. And like, right? Who are you to say we should stop right now? Like, because you do like there, there was probably people before the advent of like the internet who said the internet was a bad idea. Yeah. True. And they, maybe they although they don't. didn't want it to happen, it happened either way. So maybe like the idea that it's going to happen either way is like more of a we need to figure out what we need to do with it before it happens, so we're not blindsided. Because like you got to keep that AI on a leash. Because that thing's gonna kill us. There's no way. <laughs> if it if it sees itself as a, a like, listen, if, if it's programmed by humans, it's going to have the flaws of humans. Did you see that San Francisco voted for them to have armed Robocops? If yes, <laughs> like if like by the time that the like, Robocops become a thing, that it, they'll be legal. No, like they like like they have them, like they're doing. It. What they are the reasons that you hate technology? Like, or what are the dangers that you see with technology? It causes so many underlying issues mentally. So say more about that. Um, Certainly you're not talking about electricity. No. Right? Well, I mean, maybe yeah. it might zap you really hard or something, but... Like, the um, creation of the internet, like, I feel like they just didn't really understand. Or I maybe mean, they did know what they were doing, but I think it got way bigger than they knew. And I feel like that is just like, um, just, I don't know, there's just, I feel like the internet gives us too much knowledge, and in that way, it, like, upsets us, if that makes sense. Mm. 
So you're primarily talking about like social media platforms, yeah. right? Like it's great to be able to look up anything you want to look up, right? The problem is people have created these different forms of technology that create addiction, right? That create anxiety, that exploit our biological processes to keep on using these products, right? If you've ever seen The Social Dilemma, which is a great documentary, I'd say watch it. I think a lot of people will agree that social media is probably very harmful. Or at least heavily problematic in its current form. Right. Maybe we like could. Pinterest is cool. Pinterest <laughs> is cool. Yeah. Like, uh, Pinterest gets to stay. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping Pinterest. Now, I've heard some of you say that you're a little worried about this AI thing. Why are you worried about that? Because it's smarter than us already. Because what humans do when they have power. Exactly. Yeah. Humans are gross. And, and when they get power, they do what Elon Musk did and like what everybody, all the other billionaires are doing and like destroying everything. And like if we just do that with something that can inf like infinitely grow in intelligence, oh my god, we're just gonna die. Or, <laughs> but is like the power what, so billionaires, I don't think they're like ontologically evil, right? Like I don't think anyone's ontologically, I don't think anyone is just like, I'm evil, right? And I don't think an AI would do that. Like, what incentive would there be for an AI to, like, want power or, like, money, right? Because, like, money and wealth, power, you can, like, kind of synonymous within, like, the current society, right? Like, Elon Musk is powerful because of his wealth right. and because of his capital, right? Mm -hmm. If an AI doesn't have, like, a need for capital or money or any, like, praise or... Well, I guess that depends on how... Integrated, it. It, how integrated it is like, into like like how hu <laughs> yeah. how human how human is the AI how right. AI are we? Which yeah. bring what that's a great question. Any arguments or analyses that we make about AI needs to answer the question how alike humanity is it going to be? Because if it's like a human one to one, then it's going to feel anger. It's going to want it's retribution. Pure. It's going to want power. It's, it's going to experience greed, perhaps. But do we really have any evidence that the algorithms and AIs that we're constructing now have consciousness or feel human emotions? I don't know. I'm not the one that made them. <laughs> They'd be there was the guy who, what, was he fired from Google or something yeah. because he thought that the AI was sentient? Yeah. Because he was talking about not wanting to be turned off. Or was that? Mm -hmm. This reminds me of like that Will Smith movie, I Robot. That's very good one. Right. All of that reminds me of that movie. Based on a story by Isaac Asimov, another person mm -hmm. that we've already read. Okay. Yeah. He likes that concept, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, when we talk about AI, what we tend to do is we tend to project our humanity onto it. Right? And we tend to think well, we should be really worried about this thing because it's probably going to kill us. Well, do we have a justification for thinking it's going to be like us in that way? We make it like us. Yeah, we yeah. can. But the thing is that it can be made like that. And the people that are making it are the people that already think like that. Mm, because they're human. And it's and, like and because human. And because like the people that create the technology that we that we use are in that position of like power, wealth, of all these things. So who's to say that they aren't going to create a product that reflects that? Mm. Yeah. So like even if they don't like make it like that originally, who says that someone can't be like someone who isn't like power hungry can't be like, oh well, we have this now, this is available, so I'm gonna buy something like this and I'm gonna take the basement that they made and I'm gonna make it fit into what I need it. Like, I'm going to make it fit so that way it can do this and this and this and this, and then I have a more powerful country or I have a more powerful, like, team behind me. Like, what if right. they're not someone who's, like, in this, like, toxic, like, power is not going to, like, change what it does because they have the resources to, they have the, like, money to. So one worry you might have is about the technology itself, but another worry you might have is how the technology will be used, how it might be exploited. Okay, here's my beef, right? I've been listening this whole time, like really trying to take this in. So, 
So if we collectively, I don't think like this personally, but if we're gonna sit and agree that like no human can be truly evil, right? You know, I think they can. But if, let's just say like humanity cannot be evil, then I guess I'm like confused on the part as to where like we don't want AI to then imitate us or to be like us because if it's not evil, right, and it's not going to do evil things mm. to us because we're not evil and we made this thing and made it in our likeness, then why should we be scared that it's going to overtake us or kill us? Like, that's inherently evil. So, like, I don't... You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it might... The thing is, a lot of people do things that we would say is immoral, um, but they're not acting according to what they think are, you know, bad motivations or bad goals. Like, look, the utilitarian is going to say... If we could kill 100,000 people right now to end world hunger forever, we have to do it. Like, obviously. God. But another thing that you might think about is, which was brought up in the video, is what is going to be important about these artificial intelligences is how they're programmed and what their goals are. There's a famous example when talking about AI about uh, an AI being programmed to be really good at making paper clips. What can happen if you make an AI like that? Well, if you give it enough power and enough intelligence, if its top priority is making paper clips, it turns the whole world into paper clips and uses all the resources for paper clips. Mm. So we also have to think about, well, what, what goals do we have and how do we program those goals in an effective way? way into an AI. It's another, a whole other consideration. You have to give the programming a proper frame with which to orient itself, which is very difficult to do engineering-wise. Another question you might ask is, is transcending our biological limitations actually desirable? I guess it depends on personal belief. Say more. I feel like for a lot of people, like, that's going to feel, like, very unnatural and, like, anti, like, their, like, like, just, like, what, like, their general beliefs are about, like, spirituality and, like, being one with Earth and, like, things like that. Like, I feel like that's, like, like, I don't really, like, listen, for me, I don't really care. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, like, sure, if you want to chip me, like, I guess we could do that. I guess we could talk about it, right? But, like, I, I just feel like it's, like, there's so many people that are very, like, natural about things that they do, and I think that this is very not that. For, <laughs> yeah, they won't like <laughs> very it. But, opposite. but you wouldn't mind getting, like, a bionic limb, right? That you I mean, crush like, car doors yeah, with. Awesome. Like that. Wouldn't that be sick? That would be awesome. Don't we all want bionic limbs? Why don't we just go all the way? No. Let's just get rid of our heart, too. Mechanical heart. But then there's no poetry about heart, bro. It's like, what, is, what, else, what does all that art mean? Ah, uh, who needs poetry when you can live in a simulation 24-7? Oh. Like, See, I love, I love... Getting all the, 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 uh, the, the banana Engineering. splits and the Call of Duty games that you want. But, like, you know what I'm saying about art, though? Art is such, like, a meaningful thing for everyone, right? Everyone, like, whatever kind of art you're into, music, like, visual art, dance, like, whatever you're into, right? What purpose, or like, how will you be able to enjoy art if you're just like a brain in a board, right? Especially like sensory art, like, well, you, like, like, you'll still be able to process music, sure, right? Well, think about it like this: once our technology becomes good enough, you could construct a a real living human body whenever you want and live inside of it. That'd be terrifying. You can move from a machine body to a, a we once we achieve a, a mastery over matter and energy, sufficient mastery, we could just make a human body. We could make a machine body. We could make you a planet. You want to be a planet or a rocket <laughs> ship? Here's the thing. I love this idea if it wasn't going to be constructed by who it's constructed by and if we could perfect it without like a lot of issues. So that's one of the main rubs, right? Yeah. Is how do we do this? First of all, how do we do it? Second of all, how do we do it right? 
all these countries are gonna be doing this at the same time. That's no, it's gonna go bad. Like, they're gonna, <laughs> like, like, so imagine like China and the United States. We're already it. doing it. We're already doing it. It's just no, you can't do it. It's not gonna work. This is this is. I see. That's it's bad. It's over. That, that ruins it. The idea that other countries exist. Ruins yeah. It. I think the goal for some of it is if you get when you go to the lower stuff like how we already have. Is it unethical if they volunteer or if they consent? I mean, I think it depends. According to the current ethics laws, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. There are people who, who really think, you know, this transhumanism thing is the way to go. They will volunteer to undergo experiments, to undergo, you know, outfitting themselves with different forms of technology. Ooh, We're already so outfitting funny. people with technology in various ways. Pacemakers, um, you know, hearing aids. A kind of rudimentary form of technology that we have now is glasses that let people see the, the visible wavelength spectrum, right? Would they still give that consent when they started to get pain? Like it started to not work out? Well, I mean, whenever you're doing research or, or experimentation, you have to give the subject informed consent. So you'd have to say, look, this might hurt. Like, are you ready to <laughs> feel the most agony you ever will feel ever? But yeah, I mean, it's. it's whether or not you think uh, outfitting yourself with that technology, even if it's going to hurt a lot, is probably going to be a case-by-case -case thing, right? Maybe you want to be able to jump 20 stories with your bionic limbs, and you think, well, look, I'm ready to experience any amount of pain. To and if somebody wants to do that, I think that they should. <laughs> I think if you want to jump, you can jump. <laughs> as long as you're not jumping on me, right? I just, oh, but I think, that, I think it's going to lead to a terrible downfall. What do you mean? Listen. We've given people a lot of scary technology, right? And that's led to a lot of very scary things that have happened everywhere. If you walk outside, you're, you might get shot because we live in America, right? And that's because people have really scary gun technology. We could all get blown up tomorrow. Right, it's exactly. True. Like, the so nukes, oh my god, fucking terrifying, right? <laughs> like. Like, why? We don't need that, right? Like, why do we have that? I. So I just think that, like, it's just a more... I, I don't... I, I guess it depends on of the availability of, of these things and how, like... Because, like, now, like, almost everyone that people know in their lives, like, has a phone, right? So, like, right. like we've, we've gotten to a point where, like, where technology is just generally assumed to be part of of somebody's life, at least like a fairly big part of it. And I just feel like if we get the opportunity for like scary or dangerous like types of technology being so on hand, like it's going to lead to an apocalypse, right? Like probably. So you're, it doesn't seem like you're so worried about the technology, but, uh, but about the controlling and monitoring and organizing it. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I feel like humans just naturally have done so much, just in general, like biology is doing bad. So I feel like if we gave humans like advanced technology that can do like crazy stuff, what are the chances that they're going to use it for good? Probably nothing. Like there's going to be people that are going to use it for bad. And then they're like a super mega human who has guns for arms. <laughs> like how, how are they going to do anything good in their life? You know what I mean? No, because if somebody wanted to jump 20 stories because they, they're they like, haha, bouncy, I want to jump up there, I'd be like, yes, do that. But then you but can just use that leg as like a hydraulic <laughs> kick. You can just like no. launch, like you can just kill someone with that. Exactly, like, that's where the like, issue they comes in. Because like, if, you if you wanted to be like, haha, bouncy, oh my god, I would do that at every day of my life. Right? Like, that sounds so fun. But how do you put like a, a safety on it? Because those things right. are like, if you can jump 20 stories, then you know how much like, like you know how much force, force that would <laughs> yeah. You just point it at something, you lift your leg up and you could just launch someone like 50 yards. There's a lot of potential dangers for technology, but it could also do a lot of amazing things. Right? If we can ma if we But I don't think the pros outweigh the cons. Okay. Like the wheels, like yeah. I'm gonna tell you one more, perhaps terrifying con. Oh. In a second. Wonderful. Yeah. My idea is 
even if we try to limit like the availability of these like technological advancements, like say we try to keep it from the general public because that could cause like mass chaos, the first people who would be available to get it would be the people in power, and therefore yeah. they would be able to use it yeah. in right. the evil way. So like, no, how right. do you there's not like a like it shouldn't be made. Like a, it <laughs> should be our first priority as a society. Here's here's another consideration. This isn't even the terrifying con yet. Okay. This research is already happening. Can we stop it? No. Yeah. So we better figure out what the hell we're gonna do, right? What if, I just hope it's not possible. I hope we get to a point where like, wow, we really tried. <laughs> oh, we really, yeah. Oh, I'm just gonna dip as soon as as soon as we yeah. have. Okay, y'all want to hear something terrifying? Yeah, okay. drop it. Do y'all know what an info hazard is? Oh, yeah, I, the Bet Roku's Basilisk. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Yep. Do y'all know what an info hazard is? No. An info hazard is something that, by knowing it, you are in danger. No. You do not know this thing I'm about to tell you. Oh, okay. I know it. You know it. So we Spare are going to have... <laughs> oh, I'm going to give them... I'm going to give them the opportunity. Oh, I'm going pre to present something to you that, if you meditate on it, is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Kept me up for a night when I first heard about it. You can save yourself by not hearing what I'm about to say. So if you'd like to leave the room, I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Ew. Like, seriously. Like, like seriously. Oh. Like, it's, I like, if this is inevitable, seriously. You're, you're uh your life uh, for all eternity may be at stake. Oh my gosh. Don't do that. Yeah. I, I cannot in good conscience not warn you first. Okay. So does anybody want to leave before I drop this no, on you? This is a social experiment right now. That's not. It's not a social experiment, I promise you. It's not. I feel like this is going to be something that I'm going to learn about eventually anyways. So Probably. I'm not, I'm not super worried. Yeah. You know what they I, said I it, say about curiosity? Curiosity yeah. put the cat in a simulation and tortured it for <laughs> eternity. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so you all want to hear this? Sure. Do it. It may not even upset a lot of you. It depends on what you believe. Okay. Do you all think right. it'll upset me? It might. <laughs> okay, let's take, let's take as an assumption a few things. Substrate independence is true. We can create a consciousness in a machine, in a simulation, whatever. Let's just assume this, all right? Let's say, let's assume the transhumanists are right in that you don't need to have a human body to have a mind. Let's also assume that based on our current rates of technological advancement in the research that we're doing, eventually we will produce an AI that will be conscious and will experience emotion like us. This info hazard is known as Roko's Basilisk. And it goes something like this. Imagine consciousness is purely physical, can be run on certain hardware and software, and that AI will eventually emerge with consciousness. The AI might not be too happy about the fact that some people did not help bring it into, exi it into existence. Roko's Basilisk asks us to consider what such an AI would do to these people. If you think this AI is going to be anything like a human, with the immense intelligence and power that it has, it will be able to read and understand the entire history of humanity and resurrect anybody who did not help bring it into existence and torture them for all eternity. Sorry, that's just 
That's like so left field that it's like funny. It's the thing is, now you know, and you have a choice before you between helping the AI come into existence or not. You have no plausible deniability now. And the AI, if it comes into existence, will know that. So if you choose to do nothing, because it, it literally simulate the entirety of human history and like, look inside yeah. your mind right now, because it could get like, it could simulate everything. I already plan oh. on being tortured for all of eternity by humans. So I am not, personally I'm not pro like that out. You're pro basilisk. I have to be. You better go out and buy some lottery tickets. <laughs> Put all that money into AI research. Mm. Okay, here's my thing. Can I talk to this thing first? Because I feel like this is like mad insecure. Nah, you're probably going to be dead before it ever comes around. <laughs> what if you're already in that? This is like so insecure. <laughs> like if I was an AI and I was like, ooh, damn everybody who didn't help me. <laughs> no, because no, how insecure is that? Why are we, why are we I'm going to psychoanalyze the AI. No, seriously, because like, what, at the end of the day, I'm dead. I'm no rocket scientist. I'm no engineer. I can barely do math as it is. I fell asleep in this class like 20 minutes ago. I'm so sorry. I have really no consciousness besides the little bit that I got right here. What exactly would I be doing to further you as an AI? You could donate. Zero. You My could donate to research. Zero. You could talk about it online. I you could convince your friends to fund AI research. There's a billion things you could do to help bring this thing into existence. But this AI needs to be asking somebody else because I'm just not the one. <laughs> and also, there's tons of other people in the universe who could further them so much farther than anything that little old me could do. There's so a I lot you could do. You I have a lot of influence. Not, <laughs> not as much as Elon not. Musk. Give up, but now you all know. Also, if you're talking about it online, being like, oh my goodness, look, put your money into AI research, you're going to sound stupid. <laughs> they're going to be like, okay, so Miss Catherine Waiter over here is a crazy psychotic like bitch and like going on on Facebook about this. The, the form on which, the online form in which this thought experiment originated shut down the form because the person who runs it saw the danger in it and said, if anybody talks about this, you're going to be Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Twitter is like free speech now, so. Wasn't it like a, a user like by the name like, like their username was like Roko? Was Roko? Yeah. And some random dude was like, "Hey, uh, what if? <laughs> what if this that, happened? Uh, well, like, don't talk about that stopped. anymore. You're banned." By when the way. When did this happen? Do we know? Mid two thousands, right? Like, I was yeah, just saying, at least it was like a four. At least ten years before. ago. Yeah. I feel like did the man wear tinfoil hat by chance? I feel like. <laughs> no, John this is if you no, think, like okay if you think consciousness is emergent you, if you uh, or if you, you make think, these assumptions if you think consciousness is physical just like your body is boom there you go you have that right there you can take solace in the fact that it wouldn't really be you though it would be a reconstruction based of on you. the based on the research that we're doing based on our rate of technological advancement it's highly likely <laughs> an AI is going to come to into existence soon and consciousness will emerge in it. no yeah. But that's all you need to get this off the ground. I don't think she's going to be that mad at me. You, you can't know. That's the thing. You <laughs> can't. There's a chance. Support. But I don't care. Like, I do, I do, but I don't. It's inevitable, and I've accepted that, like, I'm going to die in, like, a scary, weird way. And I think that that's better than just, like, rotting. Well, you can all... <laughs> unless, like, you're caught... Con- if you think about it, like, yeah. if you think in the sense of, like, your, your, like, now self is not a part of if, if, if the entirety of what it means to be a human is physical, it can just take all the matter and energy it needs to and reconstruct you. Wait, so far, I'm dead, right? And they reconstruct me just for fun these? Yeah, it looks worse because you're not just before the right? <laughs> right? With all our memories. Because you didn't help it right, right now. So you can reconstruct <laughs> everything. I mean, it's just a thing because I'm going to give you a hard time with fucking resting me and I'm dead. <laughs> Don't do it. I was resting. Yeah, I was resting and you resurrected me. You got wrong. Don't try it. a really good book series. They turned into a show on Netflix called Order Carbon. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, and they actually, in order to travel the world, that they take human conscious and put it on a stat, which is a disc. Yeah, right. they search, insert in the back of people's bodies. Basically, they treat like your body is like they call it sleep, so it's replaceable. It's very interesting. The problem is now none of you have plausible deniability. <laughs> so if that thing does come into existence, if that comes in, if that thing comes into existence and asks you, why didn't you donate any money 
I'm telling him to go for you. Because mm. you told me. Exactly. I'm already screwed. You're already <laughs> rotting, so. I, well, technically, unless your consciousness is like an ethereal, like so, if we're, 